<laughs> now, you know, it, these two books really go hand in hand to me. I was reading them each, and there was just so much cross-fertilization there that uh, I think anyone here, in the sound of my voice here, should get both of them and read them one after the other. You'll see what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, one of the things that I remember so vividly, I was in freshman year in college when it happened, and that, uh, of course, as you mentioned so well and talk about so well in the book, how television, new television, bound the country together. We all went through yes. the exact same emotions and images at the exact same time. And I can hear clearly the silence. You both speak about the silence as the bodies would go by, either Lincoln or um, Kennedy, and the, the, the profound silence that was there. But that also then begged my question, what about the agitation that also happened after each one? And certainly you talked uh, greatly about the agitation in the streets and wanting to burn down Fords. The and murders. The, and the mur get to them, and of course agitation got Oswald, did it not? Uh, Talk about the, the agitation. The vigilante fact, mentality is, is always there. Here is a, a letter that I have from Chicago, April 17th of 65, mentioning that four people had been killed here. It's the second letter I've had that had the same uh, evidence of the four people being shot here. And others were. We said in our book how they were tired and feathered if they didn't show enough. But talk about the agitation well, as, in, in both instances. As John Matthews apart. said, those who were the wisest knew the least. <laughs> you really wanted to stay as far removed as you could from it, and there is always that, that visceral vigilantism that will exist among the mob. There doesn't seem to have been that kind of street violence after Oswald murdered JFK, because after Lincoln was murdered, a man even said in front of Ford's Theater when Lincoln was dying inside, three cheers for Jeff Davis. A man was murdered right in front of the Peterson House when Lincoln was inside. People weren't saying hurrah publicly for Oswald. I have it on good authority from students who were in a number of Southern schools that children broke out into cheers and applause when they heard the news that President Kennedy had been killed. But they weren't doing it on northern streets, where there might have been violence. Uh, the, the principal act of violence, of course, was the assassination of Lee Harvey Oswald two days after the assassination. Dallas was blamed by America for the murder of President Kennedy. Dallas was tarred as the city of hate. Uh, Right-wingers killed the president. The conservatives did it. Earl Warren uh, perpetuated that slander at his tribute to JFK at the U.S. Capitol. The right wing didn't kill Kennedy. Dallas didn't kill Kennedy. As Jackie said, at the autopsy of her husband, I can't believe it was some silly little communist. That's who he was. Socialist, Marxist, call him what you want. He called himself all those things. But Dallas took the blame for years. They wanted to tear down the Texas School Book Depository to hide their shame. The murder of JFK was not the fault of Dallas. The city didn't well, kill him. Why were we at that moment thinking about Dallas that way? Because I know I was hearing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, should he be there or not? And it was uh, a great, uh, great problem. Yeah. Well, uh, Adlai Stevenson had been harassed a month earlier when he visited Dallas. Uh, uh, people heckled, heckled him at his speech. A woman either intentionally or accidentally hit him in the head with a protest sign when he said, Madam, may, how may I help you? And uh, Kennedy was warned, Dallas is a tough town. It's very conservative. They don't like you there. But strangely, the entire Texas trip, of course, JFK arrived the day before, the 21st, and uh, the, the Texas trip was going great. They loved him in Houston and San Antonio, and he said to Jackie that this trip is going great. Look at the last words he heard. They certainly love you. Yeah, and, and a huge crowd lined the streets of Dallas. The motorcade was to be 45 minutes long. Another minute, and he would have survived his trip through Dallas because the Dealey Plaza was at the tail end of the motorcade. He did say something interesting about Dallas the morning he was shot. He was in the hotel room in Fort Worth with Jackie, and he was looking at a Dallas newspaper. He's going to leave and fly to Dallas, and he found a full-page ad that welcomed him to Texas. And he thought, great. Then he starts reading it, and it's 12 points of attack, accusing him of being a communist, an anti-American, of killing our boys in Vietnam. And he says, Jackie, look at this. We're flying into nut country today. And then he said another thing. Last night when we got to our hotel room in Fort Worth, it was midnight, it was raining, the crowds were pressing in. Any man could have pulled a pistol from a briefcase and shot me and run off into the night. 
And then he said another thing. What would stop a man with a rifle in a tall building from assassinating me? Nothing. So why worry about it? Little did he know, as he said that to Jackie, that man was already waiting for him in that tall building in mm. Dallas. Mm. Um, we've already heard of one skull going missing, one head going missing. <laughs> Powell's head went missing until just in the 90s, was finally found and then mm -hmm. buried in Florida. A brain went missing and was in a uh, leak-proof cylinder for years in a box in, in, in National Archives, and now that's gone missing. It is true. It is true. Everything above the shoulders. Goes there, there's, there's, well, President Kennedy was buried with his head, but President Kennedy was buried without his brain. Uh, the evidence of that is airtight. It was put in this stainless steel container with the screw top lid, and it was stored of all places in a locked Secret Service file cabinet in the executive office of the President of the United States. Then it was transferred to a special room at the National Archives where Evelyn Lincoln, JFK's principal personal secretary, was organizing his artifacts and personal papers. The brain was stored in a footlocker along with dozens of medical slides from the autopsy, blood samples, tissue samples, and even fragments of skull. Uh, a fragment was found by a passerby in the street and he placed it in a small Neiman Marcus box and turned it over to the Secret Service. Then it was discovered on all days, Halloween 1966, the entire Foot Locker was gone. Now I believe I know who took that brain and took all those samples, but there's no doubt that they're gone. It was John Wilkes Booth who took it. <laughs> <laughs> it was Robert Kennedy, of course. Well, uh, that, was, that was one that was thought, and that's the, what you say. The best evidence supports that Robert Kennedy took all these materials. With For these, what reason? Not to conceal evidence of a conspiracy, which is what the conspirator uh, believers want you to think, to conceal evidence that the president was shot from the front. He was not shot from the front. There was no shooter at the grassy knoll. No evidence supports that. I'm convinced that Robert Kennedy took all these medical materials to conceal from the American people the true nature of John F. Kennedy's poor health throughout his life. If the American people knew how ill he was in 1960, he might not have been elected president. Addison's disease, cortisone, steroids, uh, uh, bowel diseases, 15 different medications, including as president when he and Jackie were taking speed, prescribed by Dr. Max Feelgood, Dr. Max Jacobson. JFK, despite his image of vitality and, and sportsmanship and sailing and touch football, uh, was a wreck of a man physically. And I think out of respect for his brother and that myth of JFK and the new frontier, his youth and, and vim, I think Robert wanted to conceal from the American people how sick his brother had been for most of his life. I, I got a feeling when I was reading that, uh, that that could be, yes, I can see that, Although, you know, maybe for history he wouldn't mind having that known for historical purposes. Mm -hmm. He's gone now. Right. I, I felt that he just wanted to gather in his brother and that that was part of his brother and not to be put into a footlocker somewhere, but to get back to the family. I, if it that, was that, him, then yeah. I certainly feel that's, the, that's one of the that, great that, motives. That could be true, Dan. Uh, but we still don't know to this day what happened in that footlocker, yeah. or where those materials are. We just don't know. Yeah. Well, maybe sometime they will come up and... They're in Area 54. There's a 53. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you mentioned that there was a recreation during the... We haven't gotten so many things, and here we are getting close to the end. Uh, the trial, we haven't really gotten to at all, and you go through that, and how they all had to come up uh, and testify. And uh, Some, again, when John Surratt was, was uh, taken in. Um, you say that there were photo of, so, but they recreated on the stage for the authorities the play, so they could see what was going they on. Brought back as many of the actors and stage right. hands as they could, and they were forced to yes. reenact the performance, pausing uh, at various moments so they could measure the wing space, uh, draw diagrams. Lieutenant Bell had the little diagrams that he drew of where people were standing, and uh, imagine the, the grief of these performers delivering these comic lines in this funny stage business out into an audience of stone-faced detectives and soldiers to, to reenact it. And someone from the Matthew Brady studio 
uh, was taking pictures that we have now that are Let me ask you about that. They're in the archives? They're in archives in College Park mm -hmm. of the set from then and uh, of the presidential box. It, it, may, it may have been Alexander Gardner, but it was from the Brady studio. Hmm. Um, one of the things that they, the, the authorities kept honing in on uh, was that width of opening, and they kept trying to implicate stagehands and others for allowing this area for Booth to go through unimpeded when the theater was trying to tell him, we need that for the theater, going from one side to the other. It's very in women hoop wearing hoop skirts they, that had that. John Ford they said it would have been. not have anything of that. John Ford said it would have been suicidal to keep that passageway blocked as much as it would blocking the front passage for the audience to come into the theater. It was person after person after person working back there testified there was nothing abnormal about that cleared wing space. Ford mandated it be kept open. That was the side the green room was on and they had to go there to wait for an entrance, come back on again, and yet they would reenact it and, and measure and on the basis of that, largely, and Ritter's box testimony, convict Spangler. Well, then let me ask you another question. Um, were they trying to manufacture that? If they'd heard over and over and over and over, this is the real fact of the thing, no, we're not going to take that for an answer. Well, Jake Rittersbach, who had been a who was a Union veteran, whose regiment had passed through the same time that Lafayette Baker was recruiting spies, had only worked at Ford's Theater three weeks, and on the basis of his testimony that no one else heard, even people like Withers and Gourlay standing nearby, was Spangler convicted. I'm going to put all, each of you to work for a few moments, happily, uh, signing for some of the many people who want your book, and. Um, and something right here to first of all give a shout out to those of you who have uh, signed books coming we appreciate your orders and for uh, helping us keep our doors open by uh, publishers knowing that books are being sold and they'll <laughs> send their authors to us so here are just some of the people I can't mention all of them a Stewart in Kanawha, Iowa Christopher in Parson Field Maine Don in Fort Lauderdale Florida Brett in Crow's Nest in South New South Wales, Australia, we thank you. Uh, Stuart in Littleton, New Hampshire. James in Lawrence, Kansas.